Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our worship service today. And we're going to get started. Got to back it up here. There we go. With Hear Our Praises. Uh, would you please stand if you're able and sing along with us? been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old hole inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. Feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, we'll save him. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves torn out. From the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a prison shaking savior you 
got chains. He's a chain breaker. If you believe it, and you receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. We experience the faithful love of the Lord as he approaches us in the paths of life that we walk in and meets us with grace. And we come in that grace to worship today and we welcome you to our time of worship and fellowship here at First Baptist Church this morning. My name is Nat Erickson. I'm the pastor here and we welcome you in this time on the outside uh, aisle of each row, 
of the, of the pews, you'll find a little red book. That's how we keep attendance to know who's here, among other things. If you could write your name down there and pass it in as well. It's a great way to let us know any concerns or thoughts you have. And you can send them in through there. We're gathered here together for our morning worship. Following worship today over here in this side room, whatever you want to call it, that room, the sunshine room, the addition, the whatever room, the West Wing. The West Wing. That sounds powerful. <laughs> yes. We're going to gather over there for a time of exploring baptism. So if you're interested, and I've talked with several people before who are expecting, but if, if you're here and you're like, hey, that sounds interesting, come on and join us. We'll be there for a little while. Yeah, I'm talking about baptism, and that's the first step in the, the next couple of weeks, we'll be gathering to talk about exploring membership. So to learn about the church, if you know you're already interested in becoming a member, or if you just want to say, hey, I would like to find out more about this church that I've started coming to, it'd be a great time to join us then. And this evening at 6, we'll be gathering for Bible study as we continue to work through the way that Jesus encounters people teaches us to encounter people as well as seeks to encounter us as we study in the Gospel of Mark. Um, coming up next week on your calendar there is youth group will be next Sunday, so mark that out. But before then, on Friday night, we'll be gathering here in this part of the church to watch I Am N, which will be a Voice of the Martyrs live stream. They'll be talking with some people who have been working in and around the Middle East area, um, and, and talking about Christians who are living and struggling and being faithful in the shadow of radical Islam. And so we'll hear, hear some challenging and encouraging messages from then, and that'll start, the video starts at 8, we'll have doors open at 7.30 and come in and join us in that. It'll be a time to wrestle with some of the more difficult truths, biblical truths of following Jesus. Um, lastly, just wanted to highlight camp scholarships. Those are due next week by next Sunday. Um, we support sending students off to camp. It's a great place that they can find relationships that will strengthen them and challenge them in their, their own growth and maturing, and, and so we want to make that available. And then um, one other thing, which I'm going to start doing, and I've been debating when to start doing it, but I'm going to start doing it regularly now, um, just because we're not in any particular financial need or asking for anything. We're going to start weekly just reminding us of, of financial things, of the opportunity to give offerings here. Part of that is because for people who are not regulars at this church, leaving out offering plates is kind of strange. Um, so we do just leave out offering plates. If you do feel so moved to give, you can just set it in there and leave. We don't pass them or have a special time in the service where we ask for an offering. And also, um, just as a, a continued opportunity to engage with us and remind ourselves of, there are a few things in Scripture that get talked about more than money and finances. And it is one of those that God challenges us with His grace in that area. And, and a, a simple way to sum that up, money makes a great servant and a terrible master. And I'm just going to start you know, reminding us for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of new people on a, on a weekly basis of, hey, this is part of the way that we fellowship and worship together, is thinking about our finances together. So I'll start doing that regularly just to let you know. And um, I'm going to go ahead and take a couple minutes now to greet people who are around you.
standing as we sing our entrance hymn. Number 10 in your hymnals. We're going to do verses 1 through 3. Uh, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear now to his temple draw near. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires e'er have been? Granted in what he ordaineth. Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy word. standing for the blessing. Father of mercy and grace, we worship you. We give thanks for the people we know, for the relationships we have, for the lives we share. Guide us in how to live in these relationships as gardens of grace. Give us insight to notice where our skills, abilities, and callings in life are just the right fit to bless others with the joy you have blessed us with. Draw us to you through the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. children's chorus today is give me oil in my lamp give me oil in my lamp keep me burning 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 give me oil in my lamp i pray give me oil in my lamp keep me burning 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 keep me burning till the break of day Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King. Give me love in my heart, keep me serving, serving, serving. Give me love in my heart, I pray. Give me love in my heart, keep me serving, 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 keep me serving till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving for the Lord. Give me wax for my board, I pray. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving for the Lord. Keep me serving till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving, serving, serving. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving, serving, serving. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving, serving, serving. Give me wax for my board, keep me serving, serving, serving. Give me wax
for my Ford. Keep me trucking for the Lord. Give me gas for my Ford, I pray. Give me gas for my Ford. Keep me trucking for the Lord. Keep me trucking till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. And if you have children and would like them to go up to Children's Church, now is the time. of your pew Bibles or on the screen. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Let us pray. Our plans and thoughts, Father God, are many. May it be your purpose that stands. May we find your purpose for the gifts of our hands, hearts, and minds to bless others. From the fruit of our labors, we give you now an offering. Bless it and multiply it for the work of grace in our midst, in our community, in our world. For it is all yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Okay. First Peter chapter 3, 1 through 7. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Then they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is the great worth of God in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give away to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as your life as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, have you joined with me here for a short story time? from the classic Horton Here's a Who. You are likely familiar with the story, but we'll, we'll pop in right at the end here and just to catch you up. Horton is an elephant who, thanks to his big ears, is able to hear the tiny Who's who live on a dust speck. No one else in the jungle of Newell can hear them, and so they're about to throw the dust speck into a boiling kettle of bezel nut oil. And the mayor of Whoville is in his last-ditch effort, and we pick up the story with the mayor. And just as he felt he was getting nowhere and almost about to give up in despair, he suddenly burst through a door, and that mayor discovered one shirker quite hidden away in the Fairfax Apartments, Apartment 12J, a very small, very small shirker named Jojo, was standing, just standing, and bouncing a yo-yo, not making a sound, not a yip, not a chirp, and the mayor rushed inside, and he grabbed the young twerp, and he climbed with the lad up the Eiffelberg Tower. This, cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour. 
The time for all who's who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country, he said. We've got to make noises in greater amounts. So open your mouth, lad, for every voice counts. Thus he spoke as he climbed. When they got to the top, the lad cleared his throat and he shouted out, Yop! And that yop, that one small extra yop, put it over. Finally, at last, from that speck on that clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean, and the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? They've proved they are persons, no matter how small. And the whole world was saved by the smallest of all. Horton, here's a who. So they're in a crisis. And there's all kinds of noise, and, and what puts it over is a new noise, not a yip, not a chirp, but a yop from Jojo. And suddenly the cacophony becomes a sound that others can hear, and they realize, oh, there's something there. There are passages of Scripture that are so drowned out in cacophony and noise of fighting over what they may or may not say, that we're not in a position to hear words of grace from them. And I'm sure as we read this passage in First Peter and as we work through it, this is one of them that people hear and up force fields, Scotty, give me poor power to the shields, I've got my opinion, I've got my interpretation, and let's do battle over this. And I want us today to, to be ready to hear a yop. The Spirit of God has grace for you and for I, even in a disputed and much argued about passage of Scripture, this passage that is before us today. Because really, what it's telling us is to follow Christ's example in being a spiritual blessing to others in the relationships we have. Now that calls for some actions on our behalf or from us. It calls for us to work within the relationships that we have to be a blessing in them. But as we do that more and more, we find that this grace which Christ offers is beneficial for us and it is beneficial for the people we're in relationships with. But as, as we first approach this passage, we do need to take a little time to appreciate what's going on in it, appreciate the difference that stands between it and us. Because that difference is important. That difference speaks about ways that society hinders or helps certain sinful patterns of living. And we need to be able to hear the way that our own society helps or hinders certain patterns of sinful living. And find in it this core message that you and I are to apply the pattern of Jesus into all of our relationships, especially marriage for those married or pursuing that direction. As we approach this passage, and of course, any passage that starts off saying, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, is going to get a rise out of us today. But as we approach it, I want us to appreciate a few things. First, I want us to appreciate how human the concerns are which this passage is really addressing. For instance, First Peter goes on to talk about, you know, braided hair and, and jewelry and clothing. Well, what's the concern he's actually speaking to? What is and isn't appropriate to wear in public? We still fight about this all the time. You go to school and it's the conflict, what's on your shirt? Are you wearing something long enough, short enough? What is and isn't appropriate to wear in public? We still wrestle with this. It's a very human concern. What pictures should go up or shouldn't go up on social media? We wrestle with this concern today. 
the, the very human concern that we all know you step out of the doors of your house and there's lots of turmoil and fighting and difficulty, but we want to be able to step back into those doors and it to be a place of peace and harmony. That's what we want. We want, at the very least, our family to be for us, not against us. That's the very practical human concern which is laid bare in this passage. A very practical human concern for those in relationships, married or in a serious um, boyfriend, girlfriend type of relationship, you often have to make decisions where you don't fully agree on it, but you only get one course of action. How do you move forward? These are very, the very human parts of life that we live in. And, and so the, the concerns which are behind what's being spoken about in this text, we still share these today. So appreciate that. It's a passage deeply dealing with very human concerns. And I also want us to appreciate that the answers that show up in this passage sound weird to us. And we can just say that, that's, that's true, they do. What's the big deal about braided hair? Braiding hair is pretty normal in our time and day. Should we or shouldn't you braid hair? Um, you know, as I already mentioned, anything that starts off saying, wives be subject or submissive to your own husbands, that's pretty much a non-starter in our culture and our time. Submission is a dirty word. Of course, we all submit to people quite regularly, but we don't speak of it or think of it that way. And so that, that raises all kinds of red flags in our mind, that sort of language. Um, we, we see this example of Sarah obeying Abraham, calling him Lord, and think, huh, what in the world is that about? You know, what kind of sense does that make? Or, or we might like, you know, husbands live with, in an understanding way with your wives. That sounds pretty good, but what's this whole weaker vessel thing? I mean, Peter, haven't you read first, second, or third wave feminism? Like, you're way behind the times, man. Um, you know, there, there's just a lot in it that's different, okay? So it's very human, the concerns. Did I just drop out here? Uh, the, the concerns are very human. The answers immediately on the text seem kind of strange to us. And am I, am I coming through? I don't think I am. So we're, we're still on, but... All right, well, we'll just keep going. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Um, the concerns are very human. The particular answers seem kind of weird. Then I also want us to appreciate the reasons behind these answers. Part of them are simply practical. Peter is writing in a time and place where legally and also socially, women had a vastly reduced set of rights as wives as compared to their husbands. Right? So he's speaking into a time that's different than ours. Right? At least before the law, husbands and wives have equal standing, and culturally we tend to assume that that's the case today. So he's writing into that. He's writing into to wives who are in kind of a precarious situation. See, the, the best expectations for a Greco-Roman wife was that she would leave her family, which puts you at a major social disadvantage. You step out of all the relationships you have into a new set of foreign ones. So she leaves her family. She's probably 10 years or so younger than her husband. Right? And if you think, if you've made this jump before, like your 26-year-old self versus your 16-year-old self, and you think, wow, I didn't know very much back then. Right? Well, if that's your primary interaction with women as a man is with your 10-year younger wife, it's not really that surprising that you get this idea that women are not quite up to snuff. Right? She's 10 years younger than you. Of course, she hasn't reached many of the, the milestones you have. So you've got this disadvantage, but you've also got the expectation that she leaves her family and she accepts your gods as the husband. 
So there's this religious expectation as well. You have a unified religion in the household, and it's the husband's religion. And here Peter is writing to these wives who are following Jesus and who are faced with a really practical problem. How do we follow Jesus when our husbands don't? So you've got these, these practical problems he's addressing and, and also deeper theological motives behind these questions that he's wrestling with. Because Peter, like all followers of Jesus, is pushing them to ask and answer the question, how do you love your neighbor as yourself when your neighbor is a spouse who you don't see eye to eye with? Of course, we could expand that to all sorts of other relationships, but there's especially a category of relationships in life where we're stuck with other people, whether we like it or not, whether we love them or not, we're stuck with them. We don't have the option of leaving, and so how do you love your neighbor as yourself when the situation is not ideal? And these are the sorts of questions that Peter is, is engaging in a really practical way. Now, his answers sound weird to us, and we can just be honest about that. So what do we do with them? Well, I want to give you a more current example that I think might help us here. I've had over the years several dear older saints as friends. I will be at a, in, a, in a casual situation, you know, sitting at their couch talking, and all of a sudden, they start talking about the Negroes. And, you know, these Negroes I went to high school with, or, you know, we had a, at, this wor- at our job, and there was a Negro who worked there. And to me, Negro sounds offensive. To me, it sounds like not the sort of word you use in polite conversation. There's a space for it in academic discussion, but otherwise, it, it's not what you just casually say over the table. But for them, for them who grew up in the 50s and 60s, at the height of the civil rights movement, Negro was the word of preferential choice. Negro was the words that Martin Luther King Jr. and the other leaders used in their speeches and their public talk. Negro was the forward-looking, pride-filled way of speaking about civil rights, and and all that that's going on. It sounds wrong to me, and it sounds right to them. Both of us are dealing with really the same question. How do we live in a mixed-race society that has a pernicious legacy of race-based slavery? That question's never going away. We always have to deal with it. But depending on when you grew up, the terms you use change. Depending on where you grew up, the way you think about it changes. Because the society that we live in dictates part of the way we have to answer and wrestle with each question. And we appreciate that when we come back to this text in 1 Peter about marriage. Marriage is the greater reality that existed long before 1 Peter and has existed long since. The particular ways that marriage worked in first century Greco-Roman Empire times are different than it works today. Right, so, so there's parts of it where we look at it and say, huh, that's interesting, and, and that probably misses where we're at. But it does speak words of grace and challenge that run deeper than the first century marriage and what that looked like. So we might ask ourselves, what are the ways that our own culture's sinful patterns of marriage might hinder or might help those who are following after Jesus today? And, you know, I think, for example, we still live in and with tyrannical husbands who dominate their wives emotionally and physically, right? Most 
Most abusive relationships are husband to wife, boyfriend to girlfriend. That's still true today. And we hear a word like husbands live with their wives in an understanding way, right? They are the weaker vessel and we can quibble about exactly what that means, but we recognize that in many relationships, husband, boyfriend, you are not to dominate your wife because you are physically able to. That is not a gracious way to treat her or anyone else. That's still something where this passage speaks for us today. You know, it might also challenge us today as we wrestle with a bigger question of divorce. And especially interesting is that 70% of divorces in the U.S. are initiated by the woman. Um, and, and most of those are, are no-fault divorce grounds. Right? Most divorces in, the, in our country are no-fault, and that's a whole other can of worms. But where did we come to a point in time where our view of marriage was such that we like easy ways out of it? And, you know, among college-educated, the, the, uh, the percentage of divorces initiated by women goes up to over 90 where did we get such an idea of marriage that the easy way out is, is the good way out? And as, as believers, as followers of Jesus who look and say, God cares about marriage, maybe there's a word of challenge of God's grace for us. But that's part of the sinful patterns of our society that we need to somehow wrestle with. Um, or, or we might think of, fragile men in our society today, which is emerging more and more as a problem of, of men who, for whatever reason, fail to make the transition to become adults who function in society. And look at that, and, and that sets us up for a whole set of other struggles and issues around relationships, around marriage, that followers of Christ struggle with today especially young women in the church who look around and say, there's not a lot of men who are marriageable for me. What do I do? It's a very real struggle that we have to deal with today. So, well, well, well some of the specifics of this passage are hard, or maybe a little unclear with, the heart of it, I think, still rings a challenge, a gracious challenge to us today that we exist in a world with marriage and with relationships where our society assumes certain things to be true and sometimes what it assumes to be true hinder us, hamper us as followers of Jesus from living faithfully and sometimes what it assumes to be true helps us. But we have to consider and we have to engage with grace. Children, does the assumed success that your parents want for you line up with the vision of success that God lays forward for you in Scripture? Husbands, does the assumed vision of a happy marriage that your wife brings to the table line up with what following after God looks for you. Wives, especially those in a relationship with, a, with an unbelieving husband or, or boyfriend situation, um, are you able to continue following in the ways of Jesus or is that hampering you to a, a degree that you're, you're walking unfaithfully? These are still things we consider and we wrestle with in grace today. And they push us to what I think is the deeper point behind this passage to begin with. The need to take the model of Jesus Christ and extend it into all of our relationships. Into each and every one of them. See, this passage is part of the household code that started several chunks back and goes for another chunk on. But what we see when we zoom out is that it, it all points like, a, like an arrow to Jesus at the center. He's at the bullseye of the, the structure, the argument, whatever one you, you want to call it. Jesus is the center point of it. Peter's main point then is this. The example of Jesus Christ is what you are to work out 
in all of your relationships in society, in marriage, slaves to masters, in politics, within the church, the example of Jesus is the pattern to follow. The example of Jesus calls for us to engage with the question, what does loving my neighbor as myself look like when it's a relationship that I'm stuck in? because I'm already married to an unbeliever, or because I'm married to someone who's a believer but is not acting like it, or because I am a child and my parents have visions for me that strike against certain tenets of following after Jesus, or we're stuck in certain relationships. Boss and coworkers, we can be stuck. But no matter how stuck we are, we still have to live in the grace of Jesus for the good of other people. And that puts us into wrestling again and again with practical questions. You know, it's a, uh, the, the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You know, some people, self included, really like just to eat lemons. But, but, I mean, they make your mouth just go, wah. And I, and I like that, but I know many people don't. But the key, right, to go from lemons, which make your mouth go, ah, to lemonade, which most people like, is a lot of sugar. I mean, that, that's the key which transitions lemons to something tasty and enjoyable. And Peter is challenging, especially in marriage, but to expand out into all of our relationships. Look, in life you have lots of lemons. You might be in an unequal relationship where one one partner is a follower of Jesus and one isn't. You might be in a household that's split. You might be living in a household of faithful Christ followers who can't agree politically. You might be at a work place where you have issues with the boss, whatever they be. Life gives us lots of lemons. And to be faithful in following Jesus isn't to run away from the lemons. It's not to run away and withdraw from all these hard relationships that we have and that we need to navigate in life. It's to say, God, I need your grace to live for the good of my partner to live for the good of my children or my parents, to live for the good of my boss or my friend or my extended family, to live for their good. And you know, they may never, they may never come to a point where they say, yes, I've noticed this grace in your life and I want to know this Jesus too. We don't have control over anyone else. We don't get to control, we can influence people but we don't make choices or decisions for them. And we certainly don't make decisions whether they'll become a follower of Jesus or not. But what we can and are called to do as followers of Jesus is that no matter how lemon-like the relationship is that you're stuck in, to look for ways to live graciously for the good of the other person that you're with to be a blessing, to provide practically so that you can live in an unhindered way, to provide for their good and your good as you work together. See, we are challenged in this sometimes strange-sounding teaching on marriage to follow the example of Jesus in our relationships, especially in marriage. An example of seeking to love our neighbor as ourself, an example of seeking to be a blessing to the other. And that sometimes calls for us to to give a gift to other people, a gift of compassionate goodness towards them a gift of 
laying down some of our own preferences and demands and saying, I will give you the grace of a gracious life lived in your presence. It doesn't guarantee that things will get better. It doesn't guarantee that your unbelieving spouse will become a, a believer. It doesn't guarantee they'll start coming to church with you. But it is the challenge and the call that, that God lays at our feet and empowers us to do to live graciously like Jesus did for the good of other people. And in those connections and in that pursuit of grace, what we will find more often than not is that over the time as we live graciously and compassionately for the good of other people, they will be good to us in return. Not all the time, but more often than not, So, we come to a passage here in 1 Peter that on its surface becomes one we debate endlessly in church contexts. It says things that are hard. It says things that we don't like the sound of. Maybe some people really like the sound of it, whatever it be. But, but I hope today in the midst of our feelings, our own thoughts about it, we're challenged by that yop sound, the sound that can break through the arguments and the debates and really call us to the carpet as God says, look, I give you grace in this passage. I challenge you with grace. Now it's for you to take it. It's for you to engage. It's for you to pick up the challenge, because this passage really is less a how-to manual about marriage today and much more a challenge for you and for I to engage God's grace and to live graciously towards other people, especially the people that we're stuck in life with and that we would give compassionate goodness to them in the manner that Jesus has challenged and taught. Would you pray with me? God, as you have given grace to us through Jesus, your Son, we pray that we would be bathed in that grace, strengthened in it, and also challenged in it, for we live in a world that, that maybe is a lot different than the first century in the Greco-Roman Empire, but it's still got a lot of problems in our, in our ways that we assume marriage works and in our ways that we assume relationships with friends and family and coworkers work or that, that, that need grace too. May we as your people become a community of grace, a community that maybe it's not seeking to overthrow the whole social order, but challenges it nevertheless in showing a different way, in showing a gracious, love-filled way that Jesus has modeled and empowers us to live in in the midst, a way that offers goodness and freedom to any who are touched by it. And may we have the strength through your grace to live that way. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our example. Amen. <clears throat> our hymn of response <clears throat> is number 260 in your hymnals. Please stand and sing with me, Come Share the Lord. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Here 
seated. 